introduction, I'm Dave Kepsel, the National Utility Sales Manager um, for the Vapor Extraction Unit. I've been at MBW for, well, it's four years now. I've, I've been doing this and hitting the pavement. And my colleague, Rick Grimal, he's the, the sales director at MBW. You guys know his face. You've seen him out in the field as well. He used to do what I did. Um, do you have anything to add, Rick? No, no, I'm excited that we got this all set up. Um, I appreciate that you guys have all taken some time out of your day to kind of go through some of this stuff. Um, you know, the, the concept behind doing this um, really kind of stemmed from some of our training videos that we did. And, you know, we did our um, live webinar a couple months ago, I think. And after that, we just felt like, you know, we wanted to extend an opportunity for everybody to be able to jump on and just have a conversation. You know, the, the challenging part about it is I, I'm, you know, I'm going through a kitchen remodel right now and I can jump on YouTube and look up how to mount a sink or how to set a cabinet or how to run electrical, but there aren't a ton of VEU videos out there from, you know, other utilities saying, Hey, this is how we run it. So we wanted to give you guys an opportunity to ask all the questions that you can't just do a quick Google search on. And uh, hopefully we'll cover all the topics that, um, you guys have and you know hopefully we'll give you guys a little bit more information and and if for some reason you know it goes long on one topic or another um we're certainly prepared to set up another call or or have individual calls as well so um, i'll toss it back over to you dave all right so let's get started so the basic application for the vapor extraction unit is to evacuate the natural gas from below ground in a safe manner and then also it gives you the possibility to pinpoint your leaks accurately with a wide, widespread gas migration. So if you have a lot of gas in an area, city blocks, you can deploy this unit and, and set it up and have 18 probes spread out through your, your migration and start running the vapor extraction unit. It's the only one of its kind. It's, it, it, when deployed at 18 probes, it has its maximum performance. Um, also, the third thing it can do is, let's say you have a lot of gas outside your your local business, your, your auto zone per se, and you bring your vapor extraction unit out, the gas is building up against the foundation. You're starting to see, you know, potentially gas reads within that building. And you can actually set up the VEU at a safe distance and it will actually pull the gas away from that building. So if all the probes work in a unison, I call it the symphony. You know, when they're singing and dancing, it's, it's great. It's, it's working at its optimal performance. So those are the basic applications for this unit for those that have not you know, used it, seen it in a demo. Um, that, that's kind of the gist of what the vapor extraction does. Um, it was invented um, in partnership with EGW and Atmos Energy out of Dallas, Texas. Um, there was a need for an, a way to expedite getting that gas from underneath ground. With the, with the clay caps down in Texas, it just took days, months, sometimes, you know, it just took very long to get that gas out. And they were using Venturi's at the time and there had to be a better way. So EGW reached out to us to see if, you know, since we're machine builders of Wisconsin, can we come up with something? And they had pitched us to Atmos and we collaborated together and created the machine we have which expedites the natural gas extraction process tremendously. Um, does anybody have any questions in terms of application or does Rick have anything to add? Yeah, I just, I wanted to kind of jump in and add something there, Dave. You know, one of the things that Mark um, Chapman had really kind of focused on was not only being able to expedite the gas removal process as quickly as we could, but also make sure that it's as safe as possible. Um, you know, some of the other methods uh, that are out there, you know, the, some of the purging style, the Venturi's or the tornadoes or horns, they do have a tendency to uh, move gas around. And, you know, you never really want to move gas around, you know, this way or that way. You want to try to get it all out in, uh, in one shot and then also be able to monitor those levels. So there's really no monitoring. If somebody's using like a vac truck, um, you have the potential to build up a potentially explosive level within that container. Um, whereas the VEU, you know, you have that sensor that will monitor the levels that you're emitting in the atmosphere. And if for some reason it starts to get towards 
um, an uncomfortable or potentially hazardous level, it'll, it'll let you know with the alarm. And then if it continues to creep up, it'll actually shut the unit off. Um, but that's kind of the important thing to keep in mind with the LEL levels is that the sensor that's attached to the VU, when I try to, I always tried to hammer on this when I went out and did trainings is that number that's showing on the sensor is not what we're pulling from the ground. Um, the number on the sensor is what we're emitting into atmosphere. Um, and it's pretty close to real time. What that sensor is taking snap, it's is doing is taking snapshots of the percentage of gas that we're emitting in the atmosphere. Um, so at 35%, we've actually increased it from 25 to 35%. I think we did that maybe five or so years ago. Um, so all the units are at a 35% low alarm level and then the 50% LEL shutoff uh, stays, the sh stays the same. Um, but the important thing to keep in mind is that, you know, I used to get questions all the time, which is, you know, if we're only emitting, you know, the sensor is showing 5% LEL, we're only pulling 5% LEL, that couldn't be further from the truth. The biggest thing to keep in mind is that you have an 850 CFM, um, essentially compressor, it's a blower inside that VEU. So for point of reference, the typical PTOs on the crew trucks is 125 CFM. So you're looking at several times the amount of cubic feet per minute flowing through that unit as opposed to um, the amount of flow that a Venturi might be able to put out, for instance. So the amount of air that we're able to induce with that gas is able to keep those levels down to the point where they stay under that 35% LEL threshold and we can still um, suck gas out of the ground uh, faster than really any other method. So. That's always the one that I want to that, that I want to point out is keep in mind that that sensor is designed to to keep you guys safe and to keep what you're emitting into atmosphere safe. That's why it's crucial during the entire process that you're still using your CGIs. Those CGIs are going to I mean that's typically for most of you guys it's part of your uh, procedures, but that those CGIs are monitoring what's going on on the ground, not necessarily what we're emitting in the atmosphere. So just kind of keep that in mind. That's that's one of the big things that I always try to touch on with everybody is that the sensor is there for a reason. It's designed to help. Um, and the, the utilities that get really good at using those VEUs by, by um, you know, articulating that bypass valve or turning probes on and off um, are the ones that are able to stay under that 35% threshold and really get the gas out fast. I know there's a lot there, sorry. <laughs> Well said, Rick, well said. Um, does anybody have any questions? I guess we'll dive in maybe related to the, the sensor itself and maybe the alarms, um, anything like that. Um, if you have any, raise your hand or unmute yourself and speak up. Okay. All right, Dave, Let's jump into the next topic. All right, well, I, I think you covered what the LEL sensor is reading. So we'll jump over that one. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that I've ran into quite often when I'm out on a leak with a utility or Rick himself has been in the past, one is one question that always comes up is when the sensor has zeroed itself out during operation, is the VEU still drawing gas from the probe? Okay, because you you got a zero, your probes are they working? It's it's got zero. It's, it can be kind of a a, a topic of conversation. Um, basically, what we recommend as a manufacturer and to the utilities. Oh, we got a question. Dave, why don't we finish that thought and then we can jump into Michael's question. Okay, perfect. Um, so when you're when you have the zero on the sensor, what you can do is when you're running it, just check the probe holes and see if the gas levels are going down. That's where Rick was just talking about using your CGIs as a, a crucial tool um, when you're out on a leak. So you have six bar holes, you know, you, you take notes on what each bar hole is reading, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, you write, you know, 25, 10, 5, 15, whatever, et cetera. And what you do is once that's zeroed out is, you're running the VEU at optimal performance, 
um, with the bypass all the way in. And you can go check, you know, wait 10 minutes, see what the levels are doing in those pro bowls. So if they're going down, the VEU is doing its job. So you just gotta, you gotta use your other tools at that point um, to see that the magic is happening and the probes are pulling that gas. So you just use your, use your um, CGIs and just always keep in mind that there's an 850 CFM blower. So that is a large amount of vacuum and air mixing with your gas levels um, at a very high level. So it could ultimately dilute it to a zero and, and it's doing its job essentially. So always keep that in mind. You're working a very powerful vacuum um, and, it, and, and use your CGIs if, if that is the case, um, because it will be doing its job. So Dave, what I'm hearing is that there is a potential to show a zero on a sensor, but not have all the gas out of the ground. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Correct, 100%. So always keep that in mind. CGIs are your best friend on a leak and, and take notes. Um, when I'm out there, I always take mental notes or type them in my phone on bar holes. So I'm, if you're trying to pinpoint a leak, you know, whatever hole is still holding gas levels, that's probably where your leak is. So that's kind of the way, you know, we, we approach that um, out in the field. That's a great point, Dave. You know, that's one of the big things I always suggest, which is kind of create yourself a map um, when you're out on a leak to try to figure out where the gas is and where the gas isn't. I, I try, I always try to find absolute zero. So, you know, on, on your massive leaks, it gets a little bit harder when you're talking about, you know, city blocks, but um, you know, the ones that are in front of a residence that might be, you know, 20 yards wide, um, you can kind of walk around and figure out where the gas isn't. Um, and then you can start to try to, you know, pinpoint that, which we'll kind of get into a little bit more. Um, as far as Michael's question, so he asked, um, what's the calibration requirement for the LEL sensors? So that's a great question. Um, you know, we, we get that question a lot, and that's one of the things that Dave kind of goes through um, throughout his trainings that he does um, across the US and Canada. Uh, and we also cover it in some of the videos that we have online. But what we, re what we recommend is quarterly at a minimum. Um, some companies put it on a uh, typical calibration cycle, like with your CGIs and they hook the VEU up, the sensor up and they do the calibration monthly. Uh, that's not bad to do. You can do that. It's not an issue whatsoever. The biggest thing is, you know, what, what we end up running into is the guys out there that don't calibrate it for a year. And then all of a sudden they're getting all these funky readings. Um, you know, nine times out of 10, a calibration solves the problem. Um, so putting it on a routine calibration cycle, which is at a minimum of quarterly, uh, will certainly help to alleviate issues. Uh, and keep in mind that that's 2.5% um, gas, 50% LEL, so that's methane. Um, and we, we do have kits that, uh, that we sell for uh, the VEU, which comes with, you know, regulator, the cups, the hoses that will hook right up to the sensor. Otherwise, you know, a lot of you guys, I mean, you guys are, you guys are the gas guys. So there's plenty of gas sitting around. As long as you get that configuration, um, you can get a, a hose in a cup and do the calibration yourself. Um, or if you have one guy that is at your shop that does the calibrations quarterly for a lot of your CGIs, that's great. You know, add one more thing to the list. Um, it doesn't take long to do. It's really easy process. It's a few steps. Uh, and like I said, we do have that video online on YouTube that uh, that kind of outlines how to do the calibration, uh, both intrusively and uh, extrusively. So mm -hmm. well that covered your question, Michael. Anybody else have any questions or anything to add? Speak freely. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, so what, uh, so Dave, when you're running uh, the VEU, how do you keep it running? How do you get it? How do you keep it going without that alarm popping off? Well, that's a great question. Um, we run into that quite often when we're out in the field. I mean, every leak is different. You're never going to have the same leak over and over um, with the variables, you know, moisture content, um, caps, you know, frost, clay, um, et cetera. You know, so what happens when your VEU is, you know, shutting off? you go out into the field, let's say you set up six probes, you fire it up, you know, you have that bypass valve all the way open and you're, you, you hit start, you turn on each probe 
and the alarm's going off, you know, it's at 35 L and, you know, 35 to 50 L, it goes pretty quick and then it shuts off. So how do you keep that running? Well, a few things that we recommend and we've done out in the field, actually, we just don't recommend it. Me and Rick have actually done it. Um, just, you know, be mindful with that, guys, because um, we've experienced it. And that's what this is, uh, this is about, share our knowledge and experience during this. And what we typically do is you can deploy more probes, you know, more probes in the ground means you're drawing more fresh air through the unit. The other thing is you could do is maybe you're on a large pocket of gas and it's just, it's, you're just up on top of the leak and you, you know, you lucked out. Well, then maybe dial it back, keep that bypass all the way open, you know, shut off a few of the, the valves on the probes or even go up to the, the main unit and close the, the inch and a quarter port a little bit. Or, you know, if it's really, really, you, you know, you start it up, you have one probe going and it's shutting off. <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen that, but I mean, in theory, anything can happen, I, you know. Um, what you can do is you can uh, take a, take the one of the caps off the face of the unit, open up the valve a little bit and induce straight fresh air, but just be, be safe because that valve does have a lot of suck on it. So if you do have it open, you're walking by, you might get a shirt stuck to it. Be careful with that. Um, and the other things you can do is, I mean, I've heard stories of this out in the field. I, I can't validate them. I, I didn't experience this one. Um, is I've, I've heard of utilities, if there's that much gas, they have 18 probes, you know, and they, it's an emergency gas is building up. They've actually taken the, the three inch manhole port cover off and, and use that as well. But we don't recommend that, but that's in extreme situations. Um, that's another way to keep it going, you know, and ultimately once you have that cover and that port off, your, your levels are going to go down and it, you can put the cap back on eventually, you know, it's not going to be, I have to run it with the cap off the entire time type of deal. You'll be able to over time, get that level down, the alarms aren't going off, put the cap back on, and then you can start opening probes back up or valves on the unit back up and getting the process going. Um, so that those are a few few ways to do it. You know, those are stories I've heard um, <laughs> and or experienced everybody. Um, but yeah, Rick, do you have anything to add on, on experience keeping it running? You know, I've seen it where you're out there and that, that annoying alarm's going off and you're like, oh, great. You know, what do we do to get it down? And you, you're, you're just, you know, each leak you're, I want to say it's trial and error almost, and 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 you find what works, and then you stick with it. You know, it's kind of like, you know, running a play in a football game. You you find your sweet spot in in the first quarter, and 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 then you just take off and you rack up, you know, fifty points. You know, it's you found what works. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, so Ryan, we'll get into your question as soon as we kind of finish uh, our thoughts on this topic right here. The Dave, you're hundred percent right. You know, no gas leak is the same. And that's kind of for me. So I, I, I've been doing it for quite a while. I'm on gas leaks all over the U S and Canada. Um, you know, from the real hot ones down in Texas, uh, to the, some, some sub zero ones up in, in, uh, in the Northern parts of Canada. So I've kind of seen, I don't want to say I've seen it all, but I've seen a lot. Um, and yeah, you're hundred percent right. So that's, Shutting off. So one of the things I always recommend, because I've gotten calls at 2 a.m. from people, hey, I can't get this thing running. You know, I had a one guy ask me, you know, it just keeps shutting off or it's, it doesn't feel like it's sucking. And he had 16 probes out, but they're all on one line. So making sure that you have the right setup is really important to the successful usage of the VU. So uh, it's 18 probes total. It's six probes per line. So that's important to remember. Um, we've gotten in the habit of recently really only selling units with um, all three sets because that's where you're getting the most efficiency. The unit actually runs at its most efficient with all 18 probes going. So it's, uh, that's an important thing to remember, especially for you for your new users out there. Sometimes guys will take it out there and just try to use one probe on a VEU kind of like they used to use a, a T-style Venturi. It's not the same. The, the, the VEU acts in direct vacuum. So um, 
and and we'll kind of get into the methodology behind it uh, but yeah for sure always use the 18 probes if you can if it's a small leak and you can get away with using six or 12 that's fine but if you have a lot of gas add more probes up to 18. Uh, if you're still tripping the alarm you know knock that inch and a half some of those inch and a half port back ports back like dave mentioned that induces less gas and more air so it should drop those levels down and then yeah in, in some situations we've opened up that uh, that that manhole port uh, but keep in mind that the way the unit is designed is it runs most efficient with those 18 probes on three uh, ports the other one the three inch port it's it's kind of an either or it's either all three or the three inch port so you can't run all four at the same time or the efficiency completely drops down from the VEU so uh, remember it's it's the three inch or the three inch and a half um, and if you do that um, you know, open up that in that three inch port, uh, just kind of keep in mind that the goal is to get that as closed as quickly as you can. So, um, but then also like Dave said, you know, the more probes you have on the ground, oftentimes we're not just pulling gas, we're pulling air too. I know it's a lot of times people don't think about the fact that there's air in the ground, but there is air in the ground. Um, as much as there's gas in the ground and gas leaks, there's air in the ground when there isn't gas leaks. So keep that in mind. Um, which is kind of a good segue to, to Ryan Fisher's question, which is what about uh, putting probes in a wet, sandy soil? <laughs> Any issues with purging the probes or uh, taking too much water? Uh, me personally, Dave, I'll, I'll answer, give, give you my tidbit before I toss it over to you for your yeah. thought. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've been in situations before, there was a couple in Arkansas where we were pulling a bunch of water um, the boys down in Louisiana, they were always real concerned with the, the water levels down there. Um, the unit is not designed to be a water pump, but it is a robust unit, just like everything else MBW makes, and it will suck a lot of water. Um, if you do that, I always recommend trying to get above the water line if you can. I mean, if, the, if it's just saturated and you're in a flood, it's going to pull water, and then you're going to have to monitor that uh, sight glass window. And then obviously make sure that you're using that uh, WD-40 or lubricant for that blower at the end of your usage. But if you can't avoid sucking water, you're gonna have to monitor it. It's not a bad thing, it does happen. Uh, like I said, they're robust units. My recommendation would be to, to try to get above that water line, but obviously below the, the soil line. If you can't, then you know, you're gonna have to make alterations or, or you're just gonna keep pulling water and that's fine too. It's, like I said, it, it will happen. Dave, what do you think about that? Right, um, totally, you can use it in water. It's a robust machine, like Rick said. Um, you know, when I've been out on leaks and we are pulling water, like you gotta be above that water line or else it, it like Rick said, it will it will pull water. You know, it, it could eventually, you know, it's gonna do that. And you're gonna see that sight glass. I call it the sight glass window, you take a peek and if you're pulling a lot of water and you see the water going through your hoses and probes, it looks like chocolate milk filling up in that sight glass. That's what I call it. And what you can do on, on that is, you know, once it gets up, you know, you, you're seeing a lot of water in that by the filter, take, you know, open it up, shut the unit down, drain that, make sure you get, you know, that drained. And then secondly, there's a little um, joint to the left of that, that you can put a ball valve on. And you can drain that automatically and you don't have to take that wing nut off the sight glass and have it drain that way. And, you know, the other thing, when you're pulling a lot of water, make sure that you're, you're using two filters, you know, change it out every eight hours. We recommend having two at all times out on a job because you never know what you're going to run into. But the main purpose behind having two is you, after an eight hours, if you're running for like eight hours straight, going to get filthy and gross that that filter just gets nasty we recommend taking some you know water rinsing off the, the filter and then putting it off to the side let it dry and put in the other one or you know in sandy conditions it, it can get you know dusty and gross so you can take that and blow it off with the air compressor air off your your trucks and clean it out that way so we always recommend having the two filters so just be mindful with that and then a lot of the utilities, probably I'd say over half of them probably that are even on this call today have put a, a ball valve on that little little joint there. 
Um, and then I've seen where utilities will take, you know, a little bit of piping and run it down the back of the trailer and it just drains naturally, you know? So I've seen things like that. The other things you might see is your probes. If it, if the ground gets muddy and stuff, you're gonna, or in any application really, if it's wet or dry, you might end up with some rocks or soil or any type of debris in the probes. So, you know, when you're checking that um, bar hole, you know, look at the probe too. Because you turned it off, if there's stuff in it, I recommend just taking your work boot, kicking it lightly. I, I highlight lightly because, you know, sometimes we get a little uh, aggressive out there um, and knocking it out, you know, keep those holes open, free of debris. Um, and that's just another tip to, uh, you know, keep it, keep it moving. That's ultimately the goal is to keep that machine running and, and, and have it do its job because safety is paramount. You know, you want everybody to be safe and get that gas out of the way. And even when you know, you get plugged Dave, you know, it's, it's keep in mind that the, the VEU is pulling gas through the ground. So it's pulling gas through the soil. So even if they get plugged a little bit, that doesn't mean that we're still not pulling air and, um, and natural gas through it. So it's, it's still working. Um, and I mean, as soon as you jam something to the ground, you're not gonna know whether or not it's up against a rock or something else. So that's why it's just all the more important to continue to use those CGIs. Um, we did have a couple questions that came through. Um, first question is uh, from Ezekiel Guzman. He said, assuming that we have more hoses than what normally come with the VEU, um, what is the maximum distance we can reach? So uh, that's a great question. Uh, and as we go out in the field, Dave and I have kind of gotten accustomed to doing this, especially on leaks. Um, I was in I was in one in Arizona that we actually drove, actually, actually two different ones in Arizona. Uh, we drove the VEU down an alleyway and then we ran several sections of hose uh, over a wall and then into someone's yard to be able to kind of not only just give us better access to that backyard, but then also divert some of that noise. Um, even though the VEU is the quietest method that's out there, it's still like 85 or so decibels. It's still a diesel engine. So if you're running at all hours of the night, it's it's louder than you know a car, but it's still quieter than the other methods. And if you can displace that noise, it's great. So to answer your question, you can go up to 125 feet from the unit to the first probe without losing any sort of efficiency. So 125 feet, uh, which is a good, I think they're we sell, uh, 25 foot sections. So you're looking at five sections. Um, it really gives you a lot of um, versatility in kind of what we're doing um, with that unit. So, and then uh, Dave Pryor has a question. For those of us that are not experienced with the VEU, can you put up photos? Uh, or literature on the screen to help understand what you guys are explaining. So I will, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, actually, I think the, um, the host, oh, Dave, you might have to share your screen. Okay, let's see. Let's see. This is the first time. Um, or do, do you have it up? Let me see I, if I can I, allow you to share. I is do that, have it up, yeah. Okay. Uh, more. Okay. I just made you a co-host, so you should right. be able to. I'm Maybe sorry we'll that you were not that earlier. <laughs> All right. Can you guys see what I'm looking at now? It should be a PDF of a VU. Dave, is that what you're seeing? Yes, sir. Perfect. So this is the vapor extraction unit. Can you see my mouse as well? Yes. Yes. All right. So this is going to be uh, this part right here is going to be the um, the exhaust for the diesel engine, the one that goes out this little elbow. This big um, this big uh, black tube that's right here is going to be kind of a dampener. Um, it's going to be kind of the exhaust for the um, natural gas that's coming out. So there's a little elbow port on the end here. Um, that's that's going to be where the natural gas kind of comes out. Uh, we've gotten the question before about putting a topper on it. Um, if it's raining out, you don't have to. There's a slit that's cut in the bottom of it for um, for drainage, and then also there's a, a spot in the bottom of this um, of this barrel here, if you will, that's also for drainage. So you can, if you want to. I've seen companies do it. You don't necessarily have to, though. 
Um, here are those inch and a half ports that we're discussing and they all have ball valves on them. So that's kind of what David was mentioning when he said you can turn them on and off. And then mm -hmm. the three inch manhole port is gonna be right here on the end. Here's where the sensor plugs in. And then this is gonna be your face plate um, that's kind of synced to that sensor. So, um, and this is the sensor that we we're talking about. It plugs in. This is kind of the brains of the operation. I always said that, you know, the, the sensor is the brains and the VE is the body. You can't have one without the other. So you got to make sure you have both or you're not going to be able to run either. Um, this is generally speaking how it's set up. You can kind of see, I know it's kind of a far off picture, but this is the sight glass window where the water would collect if you guys were pulling a lot of water. Um, and then there, like Dave mentioned, you can either take off that sight glass or use the, um, there's a little spot right there. You can put a ball valve on for draining it. And this is generally speaking how you would set up those probes. So I always recommend setting up the center sections of probes right over the top of where you think the, um, right where you think that the, that the leak is gonna be. And then it's kind of a, a plume, if you will, if you're right, then you know everything's going to kind of pull back to those center sections, and then you can start shutting off the outside ones as the, the leak continues. And then the goal is really to kind of pinpoint it to the point where you only have one probe that you're pulling from, um, and then you know you're kind of minimizing the potential for digging and not hitting the right spot. So um, mm -hmm. this is kind of this is the the probe kit. Uh, these are the, the probes over here, um, comes with five, five foot hoses, one 25 foot hose and six probes. This is our sensor kit. We offer trailer options, probes. I always recommend a service kit um, because it's one of those things where, you know, it's kind of preventative. If something pops up, you need an oil filter, you need a fuel filter, you need something, or you need an additional um, air filter, then you have it um, right on hand. And then you can get additional five foot hoses, 25 foot hoses, and uh, the manhole kit as well. So, mm -hmm. um, so that kind of should give you an idea. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. I think there's some other questions that, um, that kind of keep it, keep it pulling, keep it popping through here. Okay. What's the next question we got, Dave? Let's scroll on up. There's been a few here. Okay, there's Dave. I think we answered Dave's question. Um, Dave Cryer, I believe. If we haven't, um, please speak up. Um, Those are right on our website, yeah. uh, the PDFs that I just brought up. And then we do have YouTube videos as well, like I mentioned. And if you need a PowerPoint or anything or, or a meeting after this, we can uh, always schedule something and discuss further with you, Dave. Um, sure. I know it is a lot of info to take in when you're, you're looking at a machine like this because it is different than everything else out there. Um, we do have Ezekiel Guzman to everyone. Um, supplemental, could all outlets be extended to 125 feet simultaneously? Absolutely, you are good to go. You can, if you have a, you know, what is that? 375 feet of hose, you can do it. <laughs> That's a lot of hose, but you're also, you know, another benefit of doing stuff like that um, is, like Rick said, you can displace that noise. You're in a neighborhood. You have, let's say you're in front of somebody's house. You might be able to get further from where you're extracting, and and, and not in somebody's front yard. You know, it, it gives you that flexibility. I mean, 125 feet doesn't sound like a lot, but you know, you're running between 80 and 90 decibels in a neighborhood at night. It could, you know, mean the world. You know, or it gives you that flexibility to get to those hard to reach areas. You don't have to bring a work truck back there, you know, behind somebody's yard, you could maybe, you know, run the hose to the backyard, ultimately, like Rick said earlier, and, and you're good to go. I mean, and the another thing is, when you're running that much hose, the probes and hoses are completely silent. So the people in their backyards, if you had to do that or buy a business, you have no, no noise, it's silent. And, and people do like that. I've been out on leaks where We've shut off their, the utility's current way of extracting gas on a demo, and we bring out the vapor extraction unit, and the neighbor comes outside immediately and says, "Oh, you guys are done! Yay!" And and then the utility's like, "No, we're gonna we're gonna try this one out now." And I I can't tell you how many times I've heard them. Once they we fire up our unit, they're like, "I'd rather have you use that one." 
because it's so quiet. And and some people have said, now I can sleep, yay! You know, it's it's. I mean, it's it's still gonna you're still gonna hear something, but it it does make a difference when you're out in a neighborhood. For sure. So I think we we jumped over uh, Paul's Paul English's question, which is the standard depth of your holes uh, to install the probe. So what I always recommend is um, depends on the application. Depend. Oh, I'm not, I'm not sure where you're at. For us up here in the in the Great White North, and for the Canadians that are on the call, we get good amount of frost up here. So it's important for us to be able to drill drill through that frost. So you're giving a path for that gas to travel through. Um, so long as you have a path for that gas to travel through, even if it's a even if you're using a bang bar um, and you can get below a clay level or a cap, if you will, a cap would be frost or asphalt or concrete or something like that. Um, if you can get a path below that, the probes only need to be in so far as those holes are. Um, now, we do have some companies out there that are gonna be in warmer climates and their gas pipe is not as deep as we have up here. Uh, so they may have gas pipe that's only you know three feet underground. You can certainly push that probe all the way down to get right on top of it if you want. Um, but so long as it's below those holes, um, and those holes have an opportunity to, to pull from, i.e. making sure that you're below that shell, then um, you really don't have any concern as far as the, the depth. Um, it's, you know, again, this is the VEU is just a tool for you guys to be able to um, you know, operate a little bit more efficiency, efficiently, and then also safely. So once it gets out in the field, I've seen a lot of utilities do a lot of really creative things with it. And, you know, certain guys want to bury that probe all the way in. Some guys want to keep it towards the top. It's totally up to you. Um, but realistically, it just needs to be below that that um, th that whole line and the, on the probe. And then as long as you have that path, you should be good to go. So um, Dave, I, I do have one more question from uh, Mr. Bill Murray. Um, what suggestions do you have when operating the VEU for long periods of time? Okay. Great question, Mr. Murray. Welcome to the show. Um, well, some of the tips and suggestions we have is when you're running it for long periods of time, you're going to need, well, every leak is different first, so you may or may not run it for a long period of time, but um, you always want to make sure you have the extra diesel fuel um, out at your job site or, you know, however you guys do it, because it it will, if you're running it all out, um, 18 probes deployed, you know, the bypass is all the way closed and the throttle's all the way up. You can get roughly eight to nine hours on one tank of gas or diesel fuel. So, so you wanna make sure you have that to keep it running. And also, I mean, some of the things you can do is when you're running it for long periods of time, you know, you're gonna keep checking and monitoring your, your bar holes on the, with your CGIs. Um, to make sure that you're still drawing gas and you're zeroing out some of the holes. Um, and then also, you know, keep an eye on that site glass window um, because you could see debris collecting in their water, um, et cetera. And we recommend if you're running it for that long a time, always, you know, make sure that you are changing out that, that big K&N air filter, you know, keep that clean because, you know, you, you treat your machine well, it'll treat you even better back. Um, is maintenance, you know, these, these are robust machines. They're gonna, they're built to last. Um, you take care of them. You know, we have utilities, probably some of them on the call that have had, had them and have used them for what, 10, 15 years already, if not more. Um, and, and they, they're still running just, just like they were, you know, from the factory because they, they keep up with the maintenance. Um, and then with the, anything else, long periods of time, um, Nothing that I can think of offhand. Rick, do you have anything to add with that? Yeah, you know, some of you guys that have been on this call have have used these units for long periods of time, um, which is kind of cool. And, and, you know, once we kind of get towards the last maybe 10 minutes, we can open it up if anybody wants to share some success stories or have some stories and then questions behind it. Um, but yeah, I mean, the units are designed to be used um, for gas extraction, emergency situations, and pinpointing. So 
they are uh, robust units that can go out there and they can be used for extended periods of time. Um, with that, uh, requires the you know the the operator or the uh, the fleet guy to be able to kind of just keep an eye on it. So uh, monitoring your your site class window for water levels is important because even though the unit does and can pull water, um, you could potentially flood the unit if you pull it all the way up. So just kind of keep an eye on it. It's really easy to do. Walk past, give it a glance. If you if you see an, you know see some uh, a void in there where there isn't any water, you're fine. Uh, it's not like an inch of water is going to flood it. We're talking about filling up that entire cavity where that air filter is um, in order to flood it. So pretty unlikely for that to happen. I've personally never even heard it happening. And realistically, I was the guy that was getting a lot of these calls at you know 10 o'clock or 2 a.m. or things like that. And I'd never heard of anybody flooding it. It's possible, but unlikely. So keep an eye on that. Um, obviously, your diesel levels is one of the things to kind of keep an eye on. You're looking at, um, if you're running the unit full out with all 18 probes, you should get the majority of a, a work session out of it, which is, Dave, what's that? I think it's at like eight to 10 hours or something like that for a full tank of gas, somewhere around it, there. Exactly it. Exactly it. Um, so You can get eight to 10 hours on it all out. So yeah, you got so plenty of time. Yeah, so keep that in mind. Um, other than that, you know, you really shouldn't, if you're operating it, and especially if the unit's been zeroed out or calibrated beforehand, you really shouldn't have to worry about doing anything to the sensor. Um, the sensor should be good to go if it's been calibrated and zeroed. Shouldn't have to worry about that. Um, I know Dave, I think you mentioned it already, is making sure that you use that lubrication at the end of a cycle. Um, if you do have any sort of moisture going through it, just to kind of lubricate, it's preventative maintenance to kind of make sure that that blower is lubricated. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, that's not much. I mean, we've uh, we've had companies that have run these units nonstop for 24, 48, 72 plus hours, and they just kind of keep going. I mean, they're you know those diesel engines, especially those those Isuzu and those the, for you guys out there that have the old Hots engines. You know those diesel engines last a long time, and they'll they'll just keep cranking along. So. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that answered your question, Bill. Dave, we did have a question come in from a, a couple of questions. One came in from Lance. Um, what's the recommended engine maintenance and oil change? I think that's outlined in the... Uh, I have it up on my screen, the manual, to answer that question. I can uh, share that real quick. Okay. Um, just confirm that it's there, guys. Um, it's right here. Can you guys see it? So one of our topics actually today, um, believe it or not, was going over maintenance and, and all that good stuff. Um, so here's our daily maintenance schedule. This is found at mbw.com. Um, you can search our machine vapor extraction unit and it'll pull the manual. It can pull um, the old unit too as well. That manual is available online and the new one current. Um, so just to go over a few things here, we always recommend you guys check your back air filter, um, check daily. Um, so like we were just talking about, you're running it, you know, for long periods of time, just take a peek inside, see if it's gummed up. If it's not, um, you can keep using it or take it out, clean it off, um, use water on, you know, the, if it's wet and it's gross and grimy, rinse it off with a hose or, you know, if it's dry and dusty and sandy, just take the air compressor air and, and blow it off. Um, for the engine, we recommend, you know, checking that. I want to say if you run it for a long period of time, you know, you check it probably, you know, every, what, 12 hours maybe, Rick, make sure. Um, or, you know, you, for just like your engines with your car, you, I say you change your oil on my car every 10,000 miles. So what would that equate to in engine hours on a vapor extraction diesel engine? Um, I'm not a mathematician, but... It would probably be once a year, maybe, if you depending on how you're using it, right? Yeah, I mean, one of those things, you know, for for a lot of you guys, you guys are either have a mechanic or accustomed to doing some work. Um, realistically, you know, you guys are doing oil changes on your vehicles probably well more than one time a year. My recommendation is, depending upon usage. Um, you know, you might be able to get away with doing an oil change on the diesel once a year, you know, pull it in during wintertime or summertime, 
um, you know, one of your times that you don't expect to have a multitude of leaks out there and just either send it to a shop or get the oil change done. It's not overly difficult to do those panels on the side open up. So you can, so a mechanic or, or whoever's doing the oil change can access pretty much everything they need. It's not a difficult thing to do, uh, get it done. It's going to, you know, like Dave said earlier, if you take care of the machine, it's going to take care of you. So, mm -hmm. right. And then just a few other items, you know, you check your, your fuel, you know, some, some utilities, I I'll be honest, I've been out there and, uh, the fuel's been in there since I left MBW and, you know, it's, or, or they filled it and, you know, they didn't use it for a few weeks or, or I mean, I hate to say it, maybe a month because they haven't had any issues. Um, and they, I've heard that they've had bad gas or bad diesel fuel go through the machine. And then, then it leads to other things. So always, always uh, check that day or yearly as well. Um, do your maintenance on the fuel. And then, you know, make sure your hardware is tightened on the unit. We don't think about that, but this unit is vibrating and shaking. So make sure that's all tight. Um, you know, check that yearly, if not every 25 hours. Um, and also make sure your fuel fuel filters clean. I've seen them out there where, you know, the utilities bought spare parts kits, but they never swapped out the filter and they've used it quite a bit. And then the fuel filters all gummed up and it's preventing the, the, the flow of the fuel. So we got to make sure we check that as well every 300 hours, if not yearly. Um, and then as Rick said, do the blower maintenance, um, make sure you guys lubricate that blower. If you guys are pulling a lot of water, moisture, you know, just make sure you blow or put four or five spritzes of WD-40 in there and then let it lubricate those fan, fan blades because that'll ensure the longevity of the blower itself. It, it's a quick, simple thing, you know, for a couple bucks, you got a can of WD-40, it's it's a slam dunk to ensure the life of that unit. And then I know we, we hammered home the, the gas sensor itself. Make sure we calibrate that thing four times a year. Um, and if you guys need any answers or questions or whatever, um, check YouTube. We have the video on there for the calibration or call me, text me um, or email me. You have. I don't know, most of you guys on this call have my info, so you guys can get a hold of me um, and, and I can try to walk you through it and we'll get this thing taken care of for you. Um, and then, you know, just test your machine because leaks do happen on weekends. Um, I do have utilities that do take their vapor extraction out of the garage and, you know, make sure it fires up, make sure the battery's charged because, and then, you know, you have the fuel, that, you know, all the tanks full, because if it's the weekend, you get a call and you have to respond to an emergency, you know, you, you want to make sure you can just hook it up on the, you know, the truck and pull and you have everything you need. But also be mindful, you might not have that VEU sensor with you. So it might be stored in somebody's office or somewhere else. Because if you're in a cold weather climate, we don't recommend you storing that in the toolbox or outdoors. Because it is a gas sensing device, um, you know, treat it like your baby, take care of it and, 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 and it'll treat you well as, as well. So um, those are a few maintenance things. I, I hope I answered that. And then every VEU does have one of these manuals, physical copies with it. You can print these off online as well, www.mbw.com and then search for vapor. Yeah, so um, we're, Terry had a question, but Phil uh, had one that was kind of pointed to what we were discussing. So he said, what are the recommended intervals for all the maintenance, uh, that all the maintenance should be performed on the engine and the blower? So, um, you know, just like, just like all things in life, that even on our construction equipment, a lot of, we use Hondas on a lot of things, although we're not, we're not Honda, we're MBW. So we always recommend referencing the, um, the engine and the blower uh, manual that comes with it. Uh, but preventative maintenance, like Dave said, on the blower with the lubrication is good. Uh, obviously, greasing any sort of grease certs is going to be important as well. Uh, and that's something that you can do. The challenging part about it, uh, Phil, and, and while I'd like to say, you know, you should do it weekly or monthly, um, some companies use these units every day. Uh, actually, quite a most of the companies use them on a pretty regular basis. Um, and some only pull them out for emergency situations. So it's 
tough for me to exactly say. I know that there's an hour um, rating for the engine, for the um, for the engine oil change and things like that. And that's called out in the engine manual, um, which we do send along as well as the blower manual. So I always encourage everybody to reference that and, and monitor those things. Uh, most, of, most of the utilities out there do have a, uh, a list that they keep with the unit on how many hours it was used, which is awesome. It definitely helps the maintenance guy out quite a bit, uh, but I would always uh, reference those things because that's gonna call out the exact amount of time that you'd need to do it. And realistically, um, a lot of the companies out there forget to do it, um, especially the ones that do only use it for emergency cases, but um, pull it out, open it up, fire it up, make sure everything's running um, and you know just do some tests. I know that some of the distribution that we have on this call does a great job of um, helping these utilities maintain these units, which is awesome uh, because that kind of keeps everything in tip top shape uh, for those situations that might pop up. So if you have a utility uh, distributor that uh, that you're working with that does maintenance, um, you know sometimes it's nice to just have them take care of it for you, their experience with it, all the folks that are on here as far as distribution have been selling these units for years. So they're familiar with it. They got guys that'll take care of it um, and definitely make sure to use them as a reference as well. So mm -hmm. um, Terry's question, Dave, was should the probe be put below the gas main? Well, Terry, um, that question, I would believe the answer would be no, you do not have to go below the gas main. Um, we recommend, you know, you place it below that cap that's preventing the gas um, from getting to, to the probes. So if there's something preventing it, you got to get through it because um, gas takes the path of least resistance. And these, these probes are designed to work in unison and draw the gas towards them. So, so you have a big pocket of gas, you're, you're, you're on top of the main, but you're not under the main. The gas will naturally migrate and work in direct vacuum um, to emit to atmosphere through those probes through the PU itself. So we do, you do not have to, you know, go below a gas main because some utilities, you know, in older systems, their mains are pretty deep, you know, and, and that's, that you're drilling for a little bit then. I mean, who wants to run a hammer drill for that long? You know, it'd be yeah. exhausting. <laughs> I'd always, I'd always say just get it right on top of it if you can. Uh, I'm assuming that Terry's question stems from maybe he's got mains, uh, or gas pipe in the ground that's relatively shallow and maybe he can even get below it. Um, I'd recommend just putting it right on top because the whole goal is to get all the gas out. You certainly don't want to suck gas down. It's going to make the process of pinpointing a little bit more difficult. So I'd say just, you know, always on top is kind of a good um, rule of thumb. And then one of the things to keep in mind, I started touching on it before is that, you know, these units, they're designed to create a low pressure system. That's the methodology behind it. So when you use these probes, you can put your hand on it. It might not feel like it's doing a lot, but it's working in direct vacuum. So the goal of the VEU is to create a low pressure system in the ground. So that low pressure system does two things. The first thing is gas 101, gas travels to the path of least resistance. I know Dave hit on that already. Number two is you have a large amount of uh, cubic feet per minute and vacuum that that unit is pulling. So it's naturally doing two things, which are both beneficial for the leak mitigation process and pulling everything towards one singular spot. Um, with the old methods like the Venturi's or tornadoes, um, what ends up happening is you can run two per line and then you'll put two here and two over there. And then, you know, it sucks this pocket down from maybe a three or four foot diameter ring around that unit and zeroes it out maybe really fast but now what you've done is it doesn't have the longevity or the force to be able to pull beyond that so now you got to pick it up and move it over here now you got to suck from that area and then lift it up suck from that area over there and you have that potential to not only move gas around plus you're not even really getting all the gas out you're just almost putting a band-aid on it for, uh, especially for bigger leaks, for smaller spot leaks, that's when you would want to use a Venturi or a Tornado, uh, something that's real tiny, zip it out, boom, let's just get it done. For anything that's bigger than that, um, maybe a four foot concentric area, you really need to consider using something that's designed to create that low pressure system because as a unit is pulling, it's pulling everything into one singular area and you don't have to move stuff around. Everything is moving towards it. And that's why when you're setting these units up in like a, 
commercial or residential area, we always say, set it up away from the house, not at the house. Is this unit's going to pull gas away. I was, I was at a laundromat in, I think it was Alabama, um, and they had gas in the laundromat. And we set it up toward the sidewalk away from the laundromat and actually sucked the gas out of the laundromat through the ground. And then we were evacuating that whole entire area. So it will pull gas from 50, 60 plus feet away. Um, it's just important to understand how to set it up. Um, and you never want to set it up where you're trying to evacuate from. You know, some of the old Venturis and things like that, because they can't pull very far, you might just say, well, we got gas at the house. We're going to put these Venturis right by the house to zip it out. That's not how you want to use these units. You want to put these further away from the house because it's going to pull everything away um, and toward that VEU. So keep that in mind when you're setting it up. You want to pull gas away, always pull gas away from a residence or commercial area and, and setting these units up, you know, 20, 30 feet away, it's going to be able to pull that. It's not like a Venturi where you're only getting that little minimal pulling range. So I hope that that answered a couple questions. Yeah. Um, Dave, if you have anything to add, um, that would be great. Or, I mean, if we want to open it up to people unmuting and just having some stories, we're running a little bit short on time. We could always set up a second session as well, but Mm -hmm. Before we do that, I think it's worth mentioning the training video that you guys just completed um, on the VEU that you'll uh, that's on YouTube and you can share with everybody here. Yeah. Um, it's about a half an hour long. It goes through everything that you would need VEU wise, uh, which is really awesome. Dave put a lot of time into it. His voice is pretty hoarse at the end of it, <laughs> um, but it was awesome. We did it after we did our webinar. We're trying to give you all the opportunity to get more information on these, especially, you know, we have a lot of these units out and we have a lot of utilities across North America that are using these things. Um, and being that, you know, with COVID and everything, we're not able to travel a lot. We still need to get that knowledge out to you, which is one of the reasons why Dave did that video. So we could share that with you. Um, and then we're always available to do trainings as well. Um, oh, looks like Heather shared it. Um, we can do virtual trainings. I know it's not the same as having Dave's gorgeous face in front of you, but um, but it, it it'll 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 pass for now. Um, we'll get back to normal at some point, and he can get back out there and get in front of you guys. But the virtual trainings are certainly helpful to get people on the same page, especially you new users out there that um, haven't had an opportunity to go through trainings. Mm -hmm.